Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Stephen Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And quick question, did you see this TikTok? This TikTok went absolutely viral, at least among my friends on Instagram. I'm much too old for TikTok. I figured that between this and Valentine's Day having just happened, I would make a comprehensive video for my ultimate video review series discussing oral STIs and bedroom trauma lesions. But first, we have to get into that disclaimer, and that is that all opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to, and that this video is for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any concerns about your oral or systemic health, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. Also, a few additional specific disclaimers for this video. First, I may need to use specific terms or euphemisms during the video, and that's because the YouTube algorithm likes to bury videos with content that it deems inappropriate. Because I'm a growing channel and I want my hard work to be seen by as wide an audience as possible, I may have to avoid using specific phrases and terms. This video will be discussing adult topics and viewer discretion is certainly advised. Another note to both providers and patients, to the healthcare providers, if you come across any of the lesions that I discussed in this video, I encourage you to set aside your own beliefs and biases and focus on diagnosing and treating patients. Please try not to perpetuate any stigma or project any shame on your patients because that's not your job. Your job, which you took an oath to perform, is to treat the patient no matter what. If you are a patient and you feel that you may have one of these lesions, I encourage you to see your nearest healthcare provider. Please don't feel shame or embarrassment. These things happen and you deserve to be diagnosed and treated without stigma. If any provider makes you feel embarrassed or shamed, know that you deserve better and seek treatment elsewhere. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now and let's finally discuss some of these lesions. First, let's discuss the lesion featured in the TikTok. This is palatal purpura secondary to fellatio. In a situation where excessive negative pressure or a vacuum is created in the oral cavity, which includes performing oral sex on someone presenting as male, blood may become extravasated from the vasculature in the palate, leading to either petechia, which are pinpoint areas of blood extravasation, or purpura, which are more broad areas of leaked blood. It is also possible to have this occur due to direct traumatic contact with the back of the palate. This is not the only situation where these lesions can occur, so don't jump to conclusions if you see something like this. These lesions can also occur secondary to excessive straw use or even excessive coughing. These lesions often go away on their own in a week or so. If performing excessive oral sex on someone female presenting, a different lesion may occur. This lesion occurs on the lingual frenum, or that area of tissue that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. If this tissue is rubbing against the lower teeth while the tongue is protruded out of the mouth, there may be a sort of callus that forms. The clinical and histologic name for this is fibrous hyperplasia. This may remodel on its own, but it also may require excision. Switching gears a little bit, there are a few STIs that can occur in the oral cavity. Some of these are nonspecific, but I can review their findings anyway. You should never jump to conclusions about an oral STI without confirmatory lab values or other clinical findings as well. But before we get into the STIs, I just wanted to briefly discuss some entities that aren't transmitted through sex, but often are falsely attributed to these practices. The first is primary herpetic gingivostomatitis, or herpes labialis. Both of these conditions are caused by the human herpes virus. However, it is estimated that around 80% of adults carry this virus incidentally. As a general rule, HSV-1 is the strain that occurs above the belt, while HSV-2 is the strain that occurs below the belt. While it is true that HSV-2, which causes most cases of genital herpes, can occur in and around the mouth due to oral genital contact, the vast majority of oral herpes simplex infections are not from sexual contact. The virus can be transmitted through other means, including droplet transmission, kissing, and sharing beverages or silverware. The next non-STI is the squamous papilloma. 
While it is true that the squamous papilloma is caused by the human papilloma virus, which can be sexually transmitted, these cases, like herpes simplex, usually happen because of other means of transmission. Also, these lesions do happen with some frequency in children, likely due to sharing beverages or utensils or toys that spread the virus into the mouth. Some clinicians may worry about abuse, which is definitely something to be concerned about in children, but these allegations should not be made on a solitary papilloma alone. Other behaviors and warning signs also need to be considered. That being said, if you ever suspect abuse in a child, you need to call your mandated reporter hotline for your state. Below you'll find the number for New York State, which is where I live and practice. Now onto the true STIs. A cousin to the squamous papilloma is condyloma acuminatum. Condyloma are also caused by the human papilloma virus, but condyloma acuminatum is actually an STI that usually occurs in the anogenital region but can occur in the oral cavity if there's contact with the oral cavity. Oral lesions usually occur on the labial mucosa and lingual frenum, but can also occur on the soft palate. You'll note that these areas are the most commonly exposed during these adult practices. There are two features that separate a condyloma from a run-of-the-mill papilloma. The first is size. Condylomas are usually one centimeter or larger. The second is number. Condylomas are usually clustered in a group of more than one lesion. Unlike the squamous papilloma, these are worrisome in children and should be reported immediately. Histologic distinction between papilloma and condyloma can be very difficult and clinical correlation is so important. Under the microscope, these may appear larger, flat-topped, and with coilocytic changes, but that's relatively non-specific. These lesions are actually preventable, and I highly recommend that eligible children get the HPV vaccine. First introduced in 2006, the HPV vaccine is an incredible aid in preventing genital warts or condyloma, as well as cervical cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer, both of which can be caused by this virus. If you are a clinician of any kind or specialty, I highly recommend talking about this vaccine with your younger patients. The current CDC recommendation, as of February 2022, when filming this video, is that children may become vaccinated at age 9. If you haven't been vaccinated, you may do so up until the age of 26 as a catch-up vaccination, even if you have been sexually active. The vaccine is actually approved through age 45, so patients older than 26 should also discuss possible vaccination with their primary care provider. HIV and AIDS also have several oral presentations, so many that when I lecture to my dental students regarding signs and symptoms, as well as transmission of HIV and AIDS in the oral cavity, I spend over an hour discussing it. I'll save a discussion of HIV AIDS for a possible future video, so make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss this video in the future. Those are the main viral STIs, and now we'll discuss some of the bacterial STIs that can have oral manifestations. The first bacterial STI is syphilis. Now, syphilis has a ton of oral manifestations in its primary, secondary, tertiary, and congenital stages. Again, if I were to do a deep dive into syphilis, this video would probably be over an hour long. So I'll be making a dedicated video all about syphilis in the oral cavity in the future, so stay tuned. The next bacterial STI is chlamydia. Chlamydia is caused by Chlamydia trachomatis and is the most commonly reported STI. HPV is the most common STI, but it is often asymptomatic and isn't reported to local health departments when diagnosed like Chlamydia is, so Chlamydia is the most common reportable STI. The oral and oropharyngeal findings are extremely nonspecific and include sore throat with red swollen tonsils, similar to a tonsillitis or strep throat. Oral and oropharyngeal chlamydia can be diagnosed with a throat swab. Gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. While genital gonorrhea is less common than chlamydia, oral gonorrhea is more common than oral chlamydia. Of note, up to 10% of men and 80% of women who contract gonorrhea may be symptomatic. When symptomatic, the most common sign of genital gonorrhea infection is purulent discharge. If gonorrhea goes untreated, a small percentage of approximately half a percent to 3% of patients will experience disseminated infection. 
The signs of a gonococcal bacteremia include muscle aches, joint aches, and skin inflammation. In fact, this skin inflammation results in a characteristic skin rash seen in 75% of patients with disseminated gonorrhea. A less common finding in this clinical scenario is ulceration of the soft palate and oropharynx that looks similar to aphthous ulcers or canker sores. Like chlamydia, pharyngeal gonorrhea is also nonspecific. When it is symptomatic, it presents as a sore throat with red swollen tonsils, similar to tonsillitis or strep throat. Also rare, but oral lesions of gonorrhea can look red, hemorrhagic, erosive, ulcerated, or purulent. Many clinicians that have seen this in practice say that it looks similar to necrotizing periodontitis without the bad breath associated with this trench mouth. Bacterial culture remains the gold standard for diagnosing this infection. How do you prevent these from happening to you? Well, first, have an open discussion with your partners and consider getting tested prior to engaging in any of these types of contact. In addition, some barrier methods, including condom and dental dam, while not 100%, can help prevent the spread to the oral cavity and reduce your risk of transmission. If you do get diagnosed with one of these entities, you should alert your partners so that they may be examined as well. There you have it, a very spicy review of the most common oral lesions secondary to adult contact. Hopefully I haven't upset the YouTube algorithm, but be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any videos like this one. And if you enjoyed it, consider giving it a like and sharing it with someone else that may as well. Thanks again for watching and be well.